Section 10.3 Hypothesis Tests for a Population Mean We will look at these two objectives in this section. Objective 1, we want to test hypotheses about a mean. To test hypotheses regarding the population mean, assuming the population standard deviation is unknown, we use the t distribution rather than the z distribution. When we replace sigma with s, we have x bar minus the mean over s divided by the square root of n. This then follows students' t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So let's recall the properties of the t distribution. Remember first that it's different for different degrees of freedom. It's centered around 0 and is symmetric about 0. The area under the curve is 1. And because of symmetry, the area under the curve to the right of 0 equals the area under the curve to the left of 0, which is 1 half. As t increases or decreases without bound, the graph approaches but never equals 0. The area in the tails of the t distribution is a little greater than the area in the tails of the standard normal distribution because using s as an estimate of sigma introduces more variability to the t statistic. And 6, as the sample size n increases, the density curve of t gets closer to the standard normal density curve. This result occurs because as the sample size increases, the values of s get closer to the values of sigma by the law of large numbers. So to test hypotheses regarding the population mean, we use the following steps. Provided that the sample is obtained using simple random sampling, that the sample has no outliers, and the population from which it's drawn is normally distributed or the sample size is large enough with n greater than or equal to 30, and that the sampled values are independent of each other. Then step one is to determine the null and alternative hypotheses. They can be structured in one of three ways. We see the two-tailed test, which has a not equal to symbol for our alternative or h sub 1. The left-tailed test uses a less than symbol for h1, and the right-tailed test uses a greater than symbol for h1. Step two, we want to select a level of significance, alpha, based on the seriousness of making a type one error. And typically this value will be given to you. Step three, for the classical approach, we compute the test statistic, t sub naught, given by this formula here, which follows the student's t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. We use our table six to determine the critical value. Notice for a two-tailed test, we'll have two critical values, a negative and a positive. Left-tailed will have a negative critical value, and for right-tailed, we'll have a positive critical value. Step four, we wanna compare the critical value with the test statistic. In a two-tailed test, we have a picture such as this. In the center here is where we would not reject the null. So if our test statistic lies less than our negative value over here or greater than our positive critical value, then we would reject it. If it's between them, then we would not. For our left tail test, we have a picture like this. with our negative t sub alpha here. And notice that in the two-tail test, we had to divide alpha in half because alpha is representing the area in the tails and there are two of them. But in the left tail test, we only have one tail. Remember that here, we, in this area, we would not reject the null. So if our test value fell less than, which would be over here, our critical value, then we would reject the null hypothesis. And then the opposite is true for our right tail test. 
we have positive T sub alpha here. And this side is where we would not reject the null. And if our test statistic is greater than our critical value here, then we would reject the null hypothesis. For a p-value approach, we would calculate the test statistic again, and then use our table 6 to approximate the p-value. So for a two-tailed test, the sum of the area in the tails is the p-value, where our tails are determined by our test statistic. We have a negative value and our positive value. In a left-tailed test, the area to the left of our test statistic is the p-value, and the opposite is true in a right-tailed test, the area to the right of it is the p-value. We can also use a calculator with our statistical capabilities to obtain the p-value, and we'll see the directions for doing that here in a moment. Step four, if the p-value is less than alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. Step five, we then state the conclusion. The procedure is robust, which means that minor departures from normality will not adversely affect the results of the test. However, for small samples, if the data have outliers, the procedure should not be used. So let's look at an example. We want to test a hypothesis about a population mean with a large sample. Assume the resting metabolic rate, RMR, of healthy males in complete silence is 5,710 kilojoules per day. Researchers measured the RMR of the 45 healthy males who were listening to calm classical music and found their mean RMR to be 5,708.07 with a standard deviation of 992.05. At alpha equal 0.05 level of significance, is there evidence to conclude that the mean RMR of males listening to calm classical music is different than our 5,710? And we want to use the classical approach. So the first step is to identify our hypotheses. So our null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to 5,710. And then our alternative hypothesis is that it was different. So that we would call the claim that it's not equal to that. For step two, we take note that our level of significance alpha was 0 0.05. And then we want to calculate our test statistic. So we have the sample mean minus our mu sub zero over S divided by the square root of N. So our sample mean was 5,708.07. And we will subtract our null value, 5,710. Divided then by our sample standard deviation of 992.05 over the square root of n, which was 45. And when we calculate this, we get a value of about negative 0.013. So this is a two-tailed test. And here I draw my picture. Remember that here in the middle is where I would not reject the null. and I need to find my critical values for t. So in a two-tailed test, remember that I'm looking for negative t sub alpha over two and positive t sub alpha over two. So let's find what t alpha over two will be. Remember that alpha was 0.05, so divided by two then, we have t sub 0.025. So we're going to look at table six and notice that our 0.025 is right here. And we had a sample size of 45, so our degrees of freedom then would be n minus one or 44. So I'm going to arrow down and notice that I don't have 44 on here, so I'm going to approximate it 
at 2.021. So I have a positive and a negative 2.021. So I'll label those here. I have my negative 2.021 on the left side and the positive 2.021 on the right side. So let's look at then where the test statistic will fall. Notice that our test statistic of negative 0.013 will be somewhere right over here. So in this case, we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now let's do the same example using the p-value approach. So remember that our hypotheses are the same. So we still have a two-tailed test and our test statistic is still equal to negative 0.013. So let's look at the calculator for our hypothesis test regarding the mean. If necessary, we would enter raw data in list one but in this case, we've, we're given our values. So we'll simply press stat, arrow over to tests, and go to number two for the t-test. So since we don't have raw data, we're gonna arrow over to stats and hit enter on it. And remember that our null was 5710. Our mean was given to us as 5708.07. And our standard deviation was given to us as 992.05. Our end value was 45. And now we want to select the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Since this was a two-tailed test, we'll use the not equal to. So that's the one we want to highlight. We just arrow to it and hit enter. Then we arrow down and highlight calculate and press enter. So with that information, we want to go back to our example and we see that we had our test statistic of negative 0.013 that we calculated by hand. We also see that our p-value is 0.9896. And so now we want to look at that p-value in relation to alpha. So we're going to compare it to alpha and we see that 0.9896 is greater than our 0.05. So since our p-value is greater than alpha, then we will fail to reject or we will not reject the null hypothesis. So in both approaches we do not reject the null. So then there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean RMR of males listening to calm classical music differs from the 5,710. So let's look at this next example where we test a hypothesis about a population mean with a small sample. According to the United States Mint, quarters weigh 5.67 grams. A researcher is interested in determining whether the state quarters have a weight that is different from 5.67 grams. He randomly selects 18 state quarters, weighs them, and obtains the following data. At the alpha equal 0.05 level of significance, is there evidence to conclude that state quarters have a weight different than 5.67 grams? Assume the data come from a population that is normally distributed. So even though our sample size is small, since we know that it's normal, we can go ahead and perform our test. So our first step is to identify our hypotheses. Our null hypothesis is that the mean was equal to 5.67. And the alternative hypothesis is that the mean is different from that. Our level of significance alpha was equal to 0.05. And so we'll look at finding our t sub alpha over 2, the positive and negative. So we'll have t plus or minus t of 0.025 in this case. And remember that our n value was equal to 18. So we look again at table 6, and we're looking at 0.025, and degrees of freedom is 18 minus 1, so we're looking at 17. So we have a value of positive or negative 2.110. And next we want to get our test statistic. So 
since our data is given to us as raw data and we have the 18 data values, we want to find the mean and standard deviation and we can put that data in our list. So we press stat, hit enter, and type our values into list 1. So now that we have our values in a list, we'll press stat again, arrow over to tests, and go to number 2, the t-test. This time we'll hit enter on data. We want to enter our null value, which was 5.67 for this example. Make sure that list 1 is highlighted for list and the frequency is 1. And then this is still a two-tail test. We go to calculate and hit enter. We see that we get our test statistic of 2.75. So using our classical approach, we'll draw our picture. We know that it was a two-tail test, so we'll label it as do not reject here. And then we know that our values we found for our critical values was negative 2.11 and positive 2.11. So our value of 2.75 is greater than 2.11, so it's going to lie over here. So in this case then, we would reject the null. Now let's look at the p-value approach. Notice that when we did the t-test, we got a p-value of 0.014. We want to compare that to alpha. If the p-value is less than alpha, then we will reject it. So we see that 0.014 is less than 0.05. So we will reject the null in this case as well. So then we see that our last step is to state the conclusion. We see that there is sufficient evidence at the alpha equal 0.05 level of significance to conclude that the mean weight of the state quarters differs from 5.67 grams. Objective 2, we want to understand the difference between statistical significance and practical significance. When a large sample size is used in a hypothesis test, the results could be statistically significant even though the difference between the sample statistic and mean stated in the null hypothesis may have no practical significance. Practical significance refers to the idea that while small differences between the statistic and parameter stated in the null hypothesis are statistically significant, the difference may not be large enough to cause concern or be considered important. So let's look at an example where we look at statistical versus practical significance. In 2003, the average age of a mother at the time of her first childbirth was 25.2. To determine if the average age has increased, a random sample of 1,200 mothers is taken and is found to have a sample mean age of 25.5 with a standard deviation of 4.8. Determine whether the mean age has increased using a significance level of alpha equal 0.05. So here let's identify our hypotheses. Our null hypothesis is that the mean age was equal to 25.2. And the alternative hypothesis is that it has increased, so it's greater than 25.2. Our level of significance alpha was equal to 0.05. So let's find our critical value. Remember that this, since it's increased, this is a right tail test. So we don't need to divide alpha by 2. So let's look at our table. So we're using a value of 0.05, and we will have our degrees of freedom is 1200 minus 1, or 1199. So we'll use about 1000 here, or 1.646. So let's calculate our test statistic. We press stat, go to test number 2, hit enter on stats. Our null is 25.2, our mean is 25.5, our standard deviation is 4.8. Our sample size is 1200, and we're using a greater than symbol since it's a right tail test. We go to calculate and hit enter. We get a test statistic of about 2.17. And our p-value 
was 0 0.015. So our value of 2.17 is greater than our critical value and our p-value of 0 0.015 is less than alpha, which was 0 0.05. So in both cases, we will reject the null. So there is sufficient evidence at our 0 0.05 significance level to conclude that the mean age of a mother at the time of her first childbirth is greater than 25.2. Although we found the difference in age to be significant, there's really no practical significance in the age difference of 25.2 versus 25.5, just a couple of months different. Large sample sizes can lead to statistically significant results, while the difference between the statistic and parameter is not enough to be considered practically significant.